From Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida, United Launch Alliance presents live Atlas V launch coverage. On board, AEHF-2, the second advanced EHF satellite for the United States Air Force. Roger, go for launch. T minus three, two, one. Atlas engine ignition. Lift off of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket. This is Atlas Mission Control, T minus nine minutes, 15 seconds, and counting. Launch countdown operations are continuing, and the team is not working any issues at this time. We have a two hour launch window available for this afternoon's mission. The window opens at 2.42 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and remains open until 4.42 p.m. Eastern. Good afternoon and welcome to Mission Control in the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. I'm Don Spencer and I'll be your commentator for today's mission. Later in the broadcast, you'll hear the voice of Barty Malinowski as he provides launch vehicle ascent data throughout the flight. And also later in the broadcast, we'll be joined by U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Kristen Hoover from the Air Force's MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. Lieutenant Hoover and I will discuss the advanced DHF program and how it is enhancing military communications around the globe. And a planned 10-minute built-in hold will occur at T-minus 4 minutes. This hold allows the launch conductor, Doug LeBeau, and his team some time to address the last-minute tasks. Uh, that they may require. However, at this point, we remain on schedule for launch at 2.42 p.m. Eastern Time. And as, as I just mentioned, the Atlas V is launching the second satellite in the Air Force's advanced EHF constellation. Built by Lockheed Martin, AEHF satellites provide 10 times greater capacity and channel data rates five times higher than that of the existing Milstar II communication satellites. These data rates permit transmission of tactical military communications, such as real-time video, battlefield maps, and targeting data. And just a few moments ago, the launch team received a final weather briefing uh, here at Cape Canaveral and was told the weather is within the launch commit criteria for today's launch. Current weather conditions are as follows. The probability of violating the launch constraints remains at 30%. Uh, ground winds are in the 8 knot range, gusting to 16 knots. Winds are out of the east-southeast. Upper level winds are favorable and within constraints. And the temperature is 78 degrees Fahrenheit here at Cape Canaveral. Looks like a very good day for launch. So the team is go for liftoff with a T-0 plan for 2.42 p.m. Eastern. Again, we have a two-hour launch window available, which closes at 4.42 p.m. Eastern. This afternoon's launch is the 30th Atlas V mission since the inaugural flight in August 2002. Today's mission is flying in the 531 configuration. The 531 includes a 5 meter fairing, an Atlas V common booster, uh, common booster powered by the RD 180 main engine, and three solid rocket boosters, and a single engine Centaur upper stage. The RD-180 delivers 860,000 pounds of thrust at liftoff with each solid rocket motor providing an additional 375,000 pounds of thrust, giving the Atlas V nearly 2 million pounds of thrust off the pad. On April 15th, the AEHF-2 satellite was encapsulated in the 5 meter diameter payload fairing. And on April 23rd, the encapsulated payload fairing was transported to Space Launch Complex 41 and mated to the Atlas V launch vehicle. For those of you watching the live broadcast, you can see footage of the encapsulation and here with the spacecraft uh, encapsulated being mated to the Atlas vehicle in the vertical integration facility. The fully integrated Atlas V on its mobile launch platform was rolled to the pad at 10 a.m. on Wednesday this week. The track mobiles used to transport the Atlas V and its mobile launch platform to the launch pad. As you can see here, the Atlas V rocket stands 197 feet tall, or about 19 stories, and weighs more than 1 million pounds, fully fueled. For those watching the broadcast, you're looking at video taken Wednesday at Space Launch Complex 41. 
It takes about 30 minutes to complete the quarter mile trip from the vertical integration facility to the pad. And we're back to live video. Today's launch is dedicated in memory of Atlas pioneer Ben Weir. After earning a degree in engineering from the University of Buffalo, Ben began his career in 1956 at General Dynamics in San Diego, where he was a test engineer in the development of the Atlas rocket. Ben's early career included positions as the Atlas launch conductor at Vandenberg Air Force Base, as well as the Atlas program manager. Following a challenging assignment leading the production of the first Tomahawk cruise missiles, Ben returned to Atlas as the vice president and program director, where he remained until his retirement in 1993. In retirement, Ben continued his dedication to Atlas by organizing a 50th reunion, as well as being instrumental in the creation of an Atlas exhibit at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. A distinguished member of the aerospace industry, Ben was recognized in 2011 with a Lifetime Achievement Award presented by the American Association of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Ben's achievements and contributions to our nation were significant as a mentor to many on the Atlas team, and his legacy will live on as his lessons are handed down to the next generation. Engineer, golfer, traveler, husband, father, and grandfather, Ben's leadership, vision, and humor will be deeply missed. This is Atlas Mission Control, a T-minus four minutes and holding. And again, this is a planned hold designed to allow the launch team some time to address any final tasks. However, again, at this time, the team is not working any issues. Preparations for this afternoon's launch are continuing. The liftoff remains on schedule for 2.42 p.m. Eastern. The issue yesterday that caused our scrub, the uh, a, a ground support valve and helium supply system uh, that was preventing uh, a proper uh, purge for the Centaur interstage adapter area. That valve was removed and replaced and we're ready to go. That issue has been closed uh, since this morning. So the Atlas team again is ready for launch with no issues in work and uh, weather uh, favorable conditions here at Cape Canaveral. The animation we'll see after liftoff is referred to as STK or Satellite Toolkit. STK uses real-time telemetry data to track the launch vehicle beyond the range of ground-based cameras. SDK is a three-dimensional visual image of the launch vehicle's trip into space. The following video highlights the important events of today's mission and incorporates the animation I just mentioned. The following profile details the important events of this mission using approximate times. This is Atlas Mission Control at T-minus 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the RD-180 engine roars to life and liftoff. The Atlas RD-180 main engine and three solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, ignite to lift the vehicle away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins its initial pitch yaw and roll maneuvers to attain the proper ascent profile and minimize aerodynamic loads. At 47 seconds, the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure. The Atlas V is now traveling at Mach 1, the speed of sound. A minute and a half into the mission, the solid rocket boosters burn out. At one minute, 54 seconds, the first two SRBs are jettisoned, followed by jettison of the third SRB a second and a half later. The payload fairing is jettisoned at three minutes, 27 seconds. Approaching booster engine cutoff just over four minutes into the flight, the Atlas V is burning propellant at a rate of more than 1,800 pounds per second, more than 95 statute miles in altitude, 250 statute miles downrange, and traveling at a speed of more than 11,000 miles per hour. Booster engine cutoff occurs at four minutes, 16 seconds. Six seconds after booster engine cutoff, the booster stage is jettisoned.
The first Centaur main engine start takes place 10 seconds after booster separation. Cutoff of the Centaur main engine follows a nearly 10 minute burn. The mission now enters an eight minute coast phase. At 22 minutes, 16 seconds, the Centaur main engine is started for a second and final burn. This burn will last just over five minutes. Following the second Centaur main engine cutoff at 27 minutes, 36 seconds, the mission enters a final coast phase. This coast phase will last approximately 22 minutes. At 51 minutes, Centaur releases AEHF for the United States Air Force. This is Atlas Mission Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. And we are just uh, just under two minutes away from polling of the launch team. In a few moments, launch conductor Doug LeBeau will be polling the team for the final go to resume the countdown. We'll stand by for just a few moments as we approach that polling event. Again, the team is uh, not working any issues at this time. We've had a clean countdown. The vehicle is ready. We have a good weather day here in Florida. And liftoff is again scheduled for 2.42 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This is Atlas Mission Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. In just a few moments, 28 launch managers and engineers will be polled for their readiness status to proceed with this Atlas launch. This is the final status check before launch for all of the vehicle systems, including the vehicle's electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellant systems. The team will verify that the ground systems, including the CCLS, computer controlled launch system, are ready for flight as well as telemetry and propellant transfer systems are ready for launch. The team will also verify that the Eastern Range operations and the, space, the spacecraft are ready for flight. Final processing steps prior to launch include completing propellant topping of the Atlas and Centaur stages and securing vent valves of both stages. So let's listen in as launch conductor Doug LeBeau performs the final polling of the team. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion, go. Hydraulics, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. Water, go. Sensor systems, propulsion, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. LH2, go. Has gas, go. Electrical systems, airborne, go. Ground, go. Facility, go. RFFTS, go. Flight control, go. Instrumentation, go. Com, go. Timer, go. GC cube, go. Umbilicals, go. ECS, go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. OSM. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Range weather and clear to proceed. Go. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. T0 is planned for 18 colon 42 Zulu. Set count to start at 18 colon 38 Zulu. Roger. T0 is set for 18 colon 42 Zulu. Count will start at 18 colon 38 Zulu. This is Atlas Mission Control, T minus four minutes and holding. Polling is now complete and the team has given the go for launch for the AEHF-2 mission at 2.42 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We will be picking up the countdown at T minus four minutes in one minute and 38 seconds. From T minus four minutes until launch, you'll be listening to launch conductor Doug LeBeau and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. At T minus three minutes, the team will secure Atlas LO2 topping. At T minus two minutes, the Atlas and Centaur stages will be transferred from ground facility power to their own internal battery power. At T minus one minute 58 seconds, the team will secure Atlas battery heater power. At T minus one minute 55 seconds, the launch sequencer is commanded to start. Centaur LH2 and LO2 topping is secured at T minus 1 minute 50 seconds. At T minus 1 minute 40 seconds, the team will command 
the flight control system to launch enable. Centaur battery heater power is secured at T minus 1 minute 38 seconds. At T minus 1 minute 37 seconds, the flight termination system is armed. At T minus 40 seconds, the Centaur tanks will be stable at flight pressures. A final propellant status check is conducted at 25 seconds. Booster engine start occurs at T minus 3 seconds, and vehicle motion occurs at T plus 1 second. 20 seconds to picking up the count. On my mark, time will be T minus four minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. T minus four minutes and counting. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus three minutes, 53 seconds and counting. And the launch team has given the go to proceed. The countdown clock has resumed. Three minutes. Securing LO2 topping. Atlas tanks to flight pressure. Two minutes, 50 seconds. FGS internal. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus two minutes, 40 seconds, and counting. The launch vehicle, spacecraft, ground systems, and range and weather are all in a go status as we progress towards T0 at 2.42 p.m. Eastern Time. Once the vehicle lifts off, it will take approximately 47 seconds to reach Mach 1, or the speed of sound. One minute, 59 seconds. Vehicle internal. One minute, 55 seconds. Long sequence of start. One minute, 50 seconds. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LO2. One minute, 40 seconds. Launch enable. Yep, just armed. One minute, One minute 20, seconds. twenty seconds. Orca's arm. FCS gun started. One minute fifteen seconds. Reduce ECS for launch. Roger. Minute ten seconds. Ten fouls locked. One minute. Rock report range status. It's the rock range is green. Forty seconds. Stable at step three. Twenty-eight seconds. ECS reduced for launch. Roger. Twenty-five seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Atlas engine ignition, zero, 
And liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying AEHF-2 for the United States Air Force. Advanced EHF satellites provide a tenfold increase in capability to our troops in the field. You're hearing the voice of Marty Malinowski providing launch vehicle ascent data. Let's listen in for the telemetry mission progress. Burn profile transitioning now to the sustained phase. RD-180 continues to operate at 100% thrust, looking good. And we're now transitioning the RD-180 to 76% thrust, as expected. Passing through Mach 1. Vehicle is now supersonic. Engine operating normally. SRB is burning normally. And we have passed through Max Q. We are now throttling back up to 95% to 100% thrust, correction. Mr. PU is coming up on open loop control and approximately, or has come up to open loop control and we see the engine's valves uh, operating as expected. SRB is continuing in a sustained burn profile, looking good. SRB burnout expected in approximately 10 seconds. SRBs are rolling off. We have SRB burnout. Everything's looking good. RD-180 continues to operate normally. Coming up on SRB jettison. And we throttle down to 95 on the RD-180. Jettison on one and two. Jettison on three. RD-180 continues to operate normally. Everything is looking good. Next mark event we are looking for is firing the power valve to activate the RCS system. Coming up in approximately 20 seconds, the RD-180 continues to operate as expected at 95% thrust. Ten seconds to the power valve firings. RD-180 engine operating nice and smooth. And we have fired the power valve. RCS system is coming up as expected. Everything's looking good there. RD-180 is operating, RD-180 engine operating normally. Next event we're looking for is throttling down to 65% for payload fairing jettison. Throttle down is complete. Getting ready for payload fairing separation. Shortly after fairing separation, we'll see the CLFR deck separate. We have fairing separation and deck separation. Engine continues to operate normally. Everything is looking good. Next mark event we're looking for is the start of boost phase chill down on the RL10 engine. RD180 has throttled back up to 87 or 80.7 percent thrust, and we start a boost phase chill down. Boost phase chill down is continuing. RD-180 is now flying in a constant 4.6 G acceleration phase, coming up on booster engine cutoff, approximately five seconds. We've completed boost phase chill. We have booster engine cutoff right on time. Coming up on staging, we have stage separation. Everything looks good, good there. Pre-start on locks and fuel on the RL-10. Ignition, full thrust. The RL-10 is up and running normally. Good steady state operating levels. Start transient looks good. And everything's looking good thus far. And the vehicle's proceeding right down the center of the range track. We have Centaur PU going to fixed angles. 
We're now operating near the lock switch stop in a open loop manner. As this is Atlas Mission Control at L plus five minutes, five seconds into the mission. And as you just heard, Rob Gannon, so actually Rob Gannon providing our uh, ascent data here for this mission. Um, and if, as you heard, he just reported the successful execution of the events comprising the early part of today's mission. Uh, all systems are continuing to operate as expected. We've uh, gotten through the first few mark events. Atlas stage performed as expected, and the payload fearing jettison, jettisoned uh, as expected. You know, main engine start, number one, the first burn of the Centaur upper stage occurred just a few moments ago, and the vehicle is performing as, uh, as anticipated. Our next event will be Centaur main engine cutoff, which will occur in about nine minutes. And I'm joined now by U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Kristen Hoover with the Air Force's MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. Lieutenant Hoover, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here for the second advanced DHF launch. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here for the second advanced DHF launch. Well, very good. As you mentioned, this is the second spacecraft to be launched for the AEHF Constellation. Uh, when was the inaugural AEHF launch, and how will this second satellite improve the system's capability? AEHF-1 was launched in August 2010 and was delivered to the 14th Air Force on March 12, 2012. Each advanced AEHF satellite provides 10 times greater throughput than their Milstar predecessors. The second advanced EHF satellite will expand the total throughput and coverage provided by the joint Milstar and advanced EHF constellation. Well, Lieutenant Hoover, could you explain the unique features and capabilities of this uh, spacecraft that enable it to support today's military? Several features make this system unique. First of all, there is extended data rate waveform, or XDR, which allows for greater throughput of signal traffic. There are multiple phased array antennas and additional downlink transmitters, which provide greater downloading points for the signal. Think of it as going from a single dial-up internet access point to a wireless cable home network, running 10 different high-powered computers simultaneously. Its backwards compatibility enables AEHF and our legacy system to communicate with each other. Since it's a protected SATCOM system, it's survivable from attack and password protected. Most importantly, AEHF supports, supports joint service interoperability with the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marines. And one more unique attribute, AEHF is the first protected SATCOM system to include our selected international partner nations. Well, delivery to orbit is really the first step in the beginning of any satellite's mission. Uh, could you walk us through some of the next steps for AEHF-2? You're right, Don. Launch is the critical first step in getting this important capability to our troops. And I don't know about you, but for me, orbital mechanics is pretty complex. So let me break down what happens as AEHF makes its way into orbit. So the satellite will undergo three primary phases over approximately the next 180 days prior to achieving its final orbit. The launch phase begins with what we, the viewing public, can see. It begins at the launch pad when the larger rockets are powered on and the rocket leaves the Earth and is no longer in view. Then, after that, smaller liquid engines use controlled burns, which move the satellite even farther away from the Earth, closer to its final orbit location. After the last liquid engine burn, solar panels are deployed and another set of smaller, more efficient thrusters fire nearly continuously to achieve the target orbit because this operation lasts approximately three months. The next phase is on-orbit testing, which lasts about 120 days. This is where people on the ground send and receive test signals to the satellite to see if it's working properly. After successful on-orbit testing, command authority will transfer from the system program office to the users with the 14th Air Force. Once final checkouts complete by the users, the satellite is then transitioned into active duty daily operations with the rest of the on-orbit constellations. Well, Lieutenant Hoover, how exactly will the AEHF system be used to support our troops in the field? And do you have any direct examples of its impact? Don, that's a great question. AEHF will enable combat commanders by increasing their situational awareness with reliable, usable data that they can use to shape a complex and agile battle space. Advanced EHF is designed to provide more flexibility and bandwidth to the warfighter than Milstar. 
This means faster transmission of existing data sources, such as voice, messaging, and minimal data, while also enabling larger types of data like full-frame video. Well, AEHF is just one of several programs managed by the Air Force's MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. Could you describe the mission of the Directorate and then maybe give us some information on some of those other programs supporting our troops from above? The MILSATCOM Systems Directorate develops, acquires, and sustains space-enabled global communications capabilities in support of national objectives. The other MILSATCOM Systems Directorate programs supporting the warfighter include the Enhanced Polar Division, Wideband SATCOM Division, Advanced Concepts Division, Space and Nuclear Control Networks Division, and the MILSATCOM Command and Control Branch. All of these programs support the Directorate's mission. Well, Lieutenant Hoover, thank you for your insight, and uh, we appreciate uh, your input here and participating in the broadcast. So we'll go back now to the mission and check on our status. This is Atlas Mission Control at L plus 11 minutes, 3 seconds into the flight, and the AEHF-2 mission and all systems are continuing to operate as expected. The mission is in the first of suit two center upper stage engine burns. In our next event, the first Centaur Managing Cutoff, or MECO-1, is scheduled to take place in just uh, about three minutes from now. So we'll go back to Rob Gannon, our telemetry engineer for today's flight, for uh, the call. PU is operating near nominal mixture ratio. Everything is looking good. Now, two minutes to nominal MECO-1, 165 miles in altitude, 2,100 miles downrange, traveling at 16,300 miles per hour. Ready. You continues to control normally. Everything looking good. Engine chamber pressure, LOX pump discharge, and fuel venturi inlet pressure is looking good. And nominal PU performance. This is Atlas Mission Control. We're at L plus 13 minutes, one second and counting. Uh, just under a minute to main engine cutoff number one, the Centaur first burn, uh, less than a minute away from cutoff. Vehicle is uh, now at, at 134 nautical miles altitude and 2,421 miles downrange from Cape Canaveral, traveling at a velocity of 17,252 miles an hour. Centaur main engine cutoff number one, expected at four minutes, 18 seconds into the flight. Now holding last position on PU in preparation for MECO. Coming up on MECO one. We have cut off. Shutdown signature looks good. 4S engines are on. Settling this is propellant. Atlas Mission Control at L plus 14 minutes, 6 seconds and counting. And we just had the conclusion of the first Centaur burn, main engine cutoff number one, occurring as expected. Uh, the 9 minute 23 second first burn of the Centaur upper stage uh, performed as expected. The vehicle is at uh, 125 nautical miles uh, altitude. 2,760 miles downrange from Cape Canaveral and traveling at a velocity of 17,765 miles an hour. We are uh, in the first coast phase, an eight minute and nine second coast phase. And so we just heard Rob Gannon reporting cut off the Centaur main engine. The mission is now in its coast phase and continuing as expected. 
Again, our next event is the second and final start of the Centaur main engine, or MS-2. That event is scheduled to take place at uh, approximately 22 minutes into the flight. 22 minutes and 6 seconds into the flight, uh, or about 8 minutes from now. While we wait for the next event, let's take a look at a video highlighting the AEHF capability. Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company is the world's premier provider of space-based systems for government, military, and commercial customers. Production of several critical national space programs is currently underway, including the Advanced Extremely High Frequency Satellite, known as Advanced EHF, under contract to the United States Milsatcom Systems Wing. After rigorous testing is completed at their respective facilities, the payload and core modules are shipped to the Lockheed Martin Sunnyvale facility for the critical phase of final assembly, integration, and test. Utilizing industry-leading process discipline, the advanced EHF satellite undergoes a series of functional and performance side-by-side -side tests to establish subsystem functionality, interface confidence, and hardware-software compatibility. Once tests are complete, the payload is mated to the propulsion core, completing the space vehicle. All current thrusters, workhorse batteries, and payload wings are installed, completing the spacecraft configuration for the Baseline Integrated System Test, or BIST. Solar arrays are installed, and the satellite is moved to the acoustic chamber for RF, launch vehicle separation and deployment tests. During thermal vacuum, or TVAC tests, the satellite is exposed to the temperature extremes it will experience in space during its operational lifetime. While under vacuum, satellite thermal and electrical functionality and performance is thoroughly tested during multiple hot and cold cycles over a 30-day period. After TVAC, the satellite is configured for final integrated system test, or FIST. Data gathered during FIST is compared to data collected during BIST and environmental testing establishing a trend for flight operation. Millstar Legacy Terminal and XDR Terminal Compatibility Testing is performed, ensuring reliable performance with both existing EHF terminals and their future high data rate replacements. Before leaving the factory, intersegment tests are performed, demonstrating command and control and communications interfaces using operational terminals. The satellite then undergoes a final confidence test, is placed in its shipping container and delivered to Moffett Naval Air Station for air transport to the launch processing facility at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida. A launch base confidence test is performed to recheck health and status. The satellite is fueled and integrated with the evolved expendable launch vehicle, providing a low cost and low risk solution for boosting the satellite into space. Prior to handover to the government, the advanced EHF satellite undergoes extensive on-orbit testing and analysis to ensure robust and reliable operational readiness. In case of a national emergency, however, the advanced EHF satellite can be used operationally anytime after the payload is initialized, allowing the U.S. military to leverage advanced EHF's protected communications capabilities merely days after reaching final orbit, as done on Milstar. Successfully delivered to orbit, Advanced EHF provides our warfighters protected communication wherever, whenever. This is Atlas Mission Control at L plus 18 minutes, 52 seconds into the flight of the AEHF-2 mission. And uh, we've heard Rob Gannon reporting a few moments ago that uh, orbital data well, looks good so far. They uh, vehicles progressing uh, as expected in each of the mark events occurring as planned. The mission is currently in a 8 minute and 9 second long coast phase. Our next event is the second start of the Centaur main engine, which is uh, planned to happen at uh, 22 minutes, 6 seconds. Mission elapsed time. And again, we're at L plus 19 minutes, 26 seconds. Uh, this event is scheduled to take place uh, in just two and a half minutes, so uh, we'll continue to listen in for the mission's progress. The vehicle is continuing uh, right now at an altitude of 102 nautical miles and distance downrange 4,227 
uh, miles from Cape Canaveral. Velocity is 17,875 miles an hour. Now plus 20 minutes into the mission. Just under two minutes to center. Two minutes to main engine start two. Start number Expect two. We'll be starting our pre mess sequence in approximately 20 seconds. Uh, first event, we'll be starting to pressurize the propellant tanks. And we've begun pressurizing the propellant tanks, increases in pressure and locks in fuel tank. Everything is looking good there. Pressure's coming up nicely, right as expected. 15 seconds, expect to go to dual branch pressurization in the fuel tank. the effects of dual branch pressurization. Everything is looking good. Uh, next major event we're looking for is fuel pre-start. And we've begun fuel pre-start. Everything looking good there. Ox pre start. Ignition, full thrust. There, all 10 is up and running. Good start transient. Good steady state operating levels. Everything looking good. This is Atlas Mission Control at all plus 22 minutes, 22 seconds into the flight. And as you just heard Rob Gannon report, the Centaur has been restarted for a second and final burn. This burn will last 5 minutes, 42 seconds. The 22-minute coast phase will follow this burn, and at, at approximately 51 minutes, we'll have separation of the second advanced EHF satellite from the Centaur upper stage and completion of today's mission. Atlas V, the launcher for today's mission, is part of the EELV, or Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Fleet. Developed by the United States Air Force to assure access to space for Department of Defense and other government payloads, the EELV program supports the full range of government missions requirements while delivering on schedule and providing significant cost savings over the heritage launch systems. In addition to the Atlas V, the EELV fleet also includes the Delta IV, and both vehicles have a record of 100% mission success. 2012 marks not only the 10th anniversary of the first launches of both the Atlas V and Delta IV launch vehicles, but also the most aggressive EELV launch campaign to date, with 11 planned missions. The maiden flight of the Lockheed Martin Atlas V. Liftoff of the first oh, yeah. Delta IV rocket. This is Atlas Mission Control at L plus 24 minutes, 3 seconds into the mission. And the mission is currently in the second burn of the uh, center upper stage. All systems continue to operate as expected. Orbital data looks very good. We have a few minutes uh, until cutoff of the second stage engine. The vehicle is at 106 nautical miles altitude, 5,530 miles downrange from Cape Canaveral, and traveling at a velocity of 19,675 miles an hour. Let's continue to listen into Rob Gannon as he provides telemetry call-outs of the MARC events. 
Again, the next event, main engine cutoff number two, the, the completion of the Centaur second burn, expected at 27 minutes, 48 seconds into the flight, just under three minutes. Engine continues to operate normally. Data quality is good. Steady state operating pressures look good. Everything is nominal. PU valves right about at zero, which is the nominal position. A quick look at other vehicle parameters. Body rates are good, nice and smooth. Tank pressures are stable. Bottle pressures look good. 2100 PSI in the bottle. And bus and battery voltages are still right where we want them to be, just over 30 volts. And engine continues to operate normally. We're passing through uh, two minutes to Miko 2. Center should burn for a little under two more minutes. Following that, we'll enter a 23-minute uh, coast duration to spacecraft up. Everything is looking good. 90 seconds to Miko 2. Center continues to operate normally. RL10 is burning right as expected. We're now one minute to Miko 2. Uh, this will be the final Centaur burn. Everything is looking good. Thirty seconds to cut off. Engines operating normally. And PU is now locked at a at its last commanded position for Miko. Coming up on Miko one, Miko two, correction. And cut off right on time. Good shutdown signature. Four S engines are on. And battery rates are looking good. This is Atlas Mission Control at all plus 28 minutes, 12 seconds into the flight. And we are in the second and final coast phase. And the mission is continuing as expected. The uh, Mark events have occurred as planned up to this point in the flight. A spacecraft separation is planned to occur 23 minutes, uh, in about 23 minutes from now. At this time, we'll take a short break and we'll resume commentary in approximately 15 minutes. Tank uh, did occur right on time, right after Miko. Tank pressures look good. Storage bottle pressures look good. Uh, still have over 1,800 PSI in the bottles. And, uh, everything is looking good. We're doing, vehicle is doing some reorienting. PTC rolls operating right as expected.
And we now have Miko 2 plus 3 orbits up, looking at the differences between our nominal and actual orbits, everything is looking good. We are right in there with apogee, perigee, and inclination. We're now inside of 20 minutes to SVSEP. Center continues to coast normally. We are slowly ramping down our duty cycle on settling thrusters as expected. And PTC roll also is operating as expected. Other vehicle parameters are stable right where they're expected to be. Two thousand seconds into the mission, just inside of eighteen minutes to SVSEP. Everything looks good. Duty cycle on settling thruster firings is slowing down right as expected. We are looking good on body rates. PTC roll is still what we expected to be at a positive one degree per second. Tank pressures look good. Bus battery voltages look good. All indications are everything is nominal.
just over 2,100 seconds into the mission. We are a little over 16 minutes prior to SVSEP. Data quality continues to be very good, only seeing minor dropouts. Everything else looks good. Good bus and battery voltages. Doing a quick scan of body rates, shown to be right at zero, with the exception of our PTC roll, which is expected at positive one degree per second. And 15 minutes as we set Everything can just look good. And the vehicle is now executing a roll reversal for the PTC roll. Uh, 13 minutes until spacecraft separation. Reversal is complete. We are now steadied out at a minus one degree per second roll. And approximately five minutes prior to SVSEP, we'll be uh, coming over the horizon to a ground station, hopefully to uh, pick up some real time onboard video for the spacecraft separation event. Twelve minutes to set. Continuing to review Centaur vehicle parameters. Body rates are nice and smooth. Bus battery voltages steady, slightly over thirty volts as they have been. And we've seen no changes in propellant tank or helium storage bottle pressures. RCS settling activity continues on the ten percent duty cycle we're expecting.
10 minutes to SV set. No change in vehicle status. Everything looking good. Nine minutes to SV set. Vehicle status has no change. Everything is nominal. This is Atlas Mission Control at L plus 43 minutes, 4 seconds into the flight. Welcome back to live coverage of the Atlas V launch of the AEHF-2 mission for the United States Air Force. Liftoff of the Air Force's second advanced EHF mission occurred at 2.42 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time at the top of today's window. And we are about 8 minutes away from spacecraft separation. We're nearing the end of the second and final coast period. This has been a 23-minute and 23-second coast period. And again, inside 8 minutes to spacecraft separation, which is our next and final event. And I'm joined again by U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Kristen Hoover with the Air Force's MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. Lieutenant Hoover, once again, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Well, Lieutenant Hoover, uh, what is your role on the Advanced THF program? Don, my role is to field the operational community from the troops in the field to the satellite support centers with the software required for communication planning. This tool allows communication specialists to make informed requests for AEHF mission support. Well, it sounds like you have a very challenging assignment. Could you describe some of the education and training required for your position? Sure, Don. I began my career as a scientist at the Air Force Research Lab in Edwards Air Force Base, California. I was in the propulsion director at researching rocket propellant. My background's actually in biology, and I have a master's in business administration. So to prepare for this assignment, I attended undergraduate space training and completed several acquisition courses. Well, Lieutenant Hoover, what advice might you have for some of the younger members of our audience who may be interested in a future in careers in aviation, space, and science, engineering, technology, and math? Well, working in science and technology has opened my eyes to how important those career fields are in every aspect of life. My job gives me a great sense of purpose, which makes me excited every day to come into the office. The Air Force has so many opportunities for anyone who's willing to work hard, no matter what their background is. My advice is to not let anything stand into your way and to push yourself every day to do your best and be your best. Well, Lieutenant Hoover, that's great advice and inspiration for a future generation of uh, rocket scientists and those who may be watching our broadcast. So thank you for that insight into your career. Well, uh, we're getting very close to spacecraft separation. How does it feel to have seen the launch? And here we are very close to the deployment of the second advanced EHF spacecraft. Don, this is such an exciting time, and it's great to be here. It's actually my first launch, and it's incredible to see the whole team at work. Obviously, launch is an important first step to getting this capability to our troops around the globe, and I'm honored to participate in the process. Well, it's certainly great to have you here. We appreciate your insight into this mission. Thank you again for being here and contributing to this broadcast. AEHF is certainly a fascinating program and an incredible capability that we're about to deploy for our troops in the field and for our nation. Yes, it is. Well, we're just a few minutes away from spacecraft separation. Let's uh, go back to the mission. This is Atlas Mission Control at L plus 46 minutes, 7 seconds into the flight. The vehicle continues to operate as expected, and the vehicle is now at an altitude of 
2,273 nautical miles and is 11,003 miles downrange from Cape Canaveral. Uh, the vehicle has passed over Africa and Madagascar and is over the central Indian Ocean. We're uh, expecting spacecraft separation over the eastern Indian Ocean as the vehicle approaches the Australian coast. So again, we're at 46 minutes, 45 seconds into the flight. Spacecraft separation occurred is expected to occur at 51 minutes and 11 seconds, which is uh, about four minutes from now. And the mission continuing as planned. So we'll continue to stand by just about four minutes from spacecraft separation. This is Atlas Mission Control. Inside of four minutes to SPSEP, we are continuing to see good video signal from the forward-facing camera due to the lighting conditions. Uh, we aren't seeing a whole lot of detail, but uh, clearly can discern that the there is a spacecraft there, and it will give us additional positive confirmation of separation once it occurs in about three and a half minutes. And we are now de-spinning from our PTC roll, right as expected, inside of three minutes to SVSEP. Roll rates are stabilized out at zero. Everything is looking good. And vehicle is now doing a reorient to SVSEP attitude. Maneuver is ex being executed in roll. Rates responding very well. Coming up on two minutes. And we are despinning in roll. Coming back towards zero. Two minutes to SB SEP. Roll rate steadied out at zero. 90 seconds to SV SEP. One minute. We are within one minute of SVSEP for AHF-2. Everything looking good and vehicle is stabilized out in preparation for SEP, right as expected. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds to set. Ten seconds.
We have spacecraft separation. We can see brake wire activity and video confirmation of a successful spacecraft separation. And we have spacecraft separation. Lieutenant Hoover, congratulations. We've just seen the successful launch and deployment of the advanced EHF spacecraft number two for the United States Air Force. Thanks, Don. This is a great day for our troops, the Air Force, and the United States of America. Well, I'd like to thank Rob Gannon for his uh, expert launch telemetry support for today's broadcast. And I'd also like to thank Lieutenant Kristen Hoover from the Air Force's MILSATCOM Systems Directorate. Once again, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Hoover, for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. For more information about this Atlas V, please visit our website at www.ulalaunch.com. And we'll leave you now with one final look at the launch of AEHF-2 for the United States Air Force. On behalf of the entire launch team, I'm Don Spencer. Thank you for joining us, and have a great afternoon. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Atlas engine ignition, zero, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying AEHF-2 for the United States Air Force. Advanced EHF satellites provide a tenfold increase in capability to our troops in the field. You're hearing the voice of Marty Malinowski providing launch vehicle ascent data. Let's listen in for the telemetry mission progress. Burn profile transitioning now to the sustained phase.